mic on. And these guys are so good in the back, um, making sure all of our sound works and everything sounds great. So let's, let's just give it up for our sound crew today. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. I think people are here at 8.30 in the morning practicing and getting ready for, for church every, every Sunday. Uh, some quick announcements. Uh, so first of all, we have this week, uh, Wednesday, is our annual meeting. It'll be held here. Uh, and so I think there's going to be a lot of new people coming into our various committees. So if you are available, come join us on Wednesday for uh, that annual meeting. If you're interested in what goes on in our church throughout the year, how we plan, how we prepare, what the vision of the church is, uh, come join us for that annual meeting. Also, uh, save the date in February. I've mentioned this before. Our talent show uh, will be happening in February. So if you have a talent that you'd like to share, it's really a great time of fellowship and community. A lot of times you get to see me up here. You get to see Todd up here. You get to see the worship band. But during our talent show, you get to see you guys up here. And we get to know each other a little bit better and have a fun time. So that talent show is coming up in February. Uh, another quick announcement too, the giving statements. Polly was telling me this morning, you probably passed them on the back table. So the giving statements for the previous year, if you want to pick those up, uh, either on your way in or on your way out. Um, again, excited to hear Pastor Todd share today. One thing I appreciate about this church, and especially me being able to do the announcement, I am able to share praises that happen in my life. Um, those of you that don't know, my father-in-law, probably about six months ago, was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, and very quickly, anybody who's been through cancer in your own life or family, it happens fast. And you go right into chemotherapy. He's gone through six rounds of chemotherapy. Uh, he had a scan, and he's now in remission. So, uh, and I know a lot of our prayer team, it's been on their list and they've been praying and I just attribute that to, yes, there's awesome doctors here in Connecticut, but we have an even more awesome God in heaven who loves us and serves us. And, and even this week I was thinking off of Todd's message last week about that two-person bike and God leading. In, in the book of Matthew, it talks about, he, uh, Jesus talks to Peter and it says, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And I think wherever we are in our lives, God gives us access to him. Uh, he gives us access to him through his son, Jesus Christ, and his death on the cross. So wherever we are, it's awesome when we have those praises, but God is also walking with us through those trials as well. So this morning, as we gather and as we worship, let's put ourselves in a place where we feel close to God. So pray with me this morning as we worship. Yes. Yes. So we have an announcement. Okay. So we know that, uh, and you can hear me through there, you know that God is good when we are in a bad place. We know he's good, right? Because he's our strength and he's our faith and our hope. But he's also good, very good when we are good. And I just had a conversation with Junior, and he goes like, and I'm like, what? And he goes like, so they are pregnant with two, not one, but two. That is good. Wow. That is awesome. I think, I think that's the announcement of all announcements today. <laughs> Praise God. Yes. Amen. I, I'm actually going to pray right now, and I'm going to pray for their family. So uh, pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you uh, for blessings in our church, Lord. Lord, isn't it awesome that we can gather as a family and say, God did this, and God did this in our lives, Lord. Uh, and we just pray for Junior and Catherine, their family, and the, the two that are on the way, Lord. We say yes and amen to your purposes for their lives, Lord. We pray for a healthy pregnancy, Lord, a united family. And with all those kids, we just ask for peace in their household, Lord, uh, of the joy of those children under that roof, Lord. We thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is near to us, that we have access to you through your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. We praise you. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. Oh. 
just singing that song, how he loves, how he loves, that if grace was an ocean, we'd be sinking, that no matter what we've done, no matter what we've said, no matter what we've thought, no matter what intentions we've had, no matter what our motivations may have been, you deeply, you profoundly love us. In spite of all those things, you love us. And you transform us. And you rise us up, raise us up, you elevate us. You give us the peace we just sang about. And we know, God, it is well with our soul. No matter what loss may transpire, no matter what can happen, it is well. Because you heal and you restore and you revive and you give us life. We thank you, God. Thank you for this time when we can sing and worship. Thank you, Lord, that you're speaking into our hearts. And we ask you to continue, God. Keep working. We love you so much. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Uh, God, thank you. Thank you, everyone. You know, um, the plan was, like six months ago, to put together, I don't know, maybe more than that, an extra team. And this is like the extra team, and it's a different kind of team. And the goal was three guitars and the piano. The, uh, that, I think one of these two pianos. And then Dan was going to be the guy playing the piano. And, you know, we love Dan, and he plays for us quite a bit. And Dan got covid yeah, I, I think he and his wife are doing fine, from what I understand. Um, I got them some orange juice the other day, brought it to their house, and I, they said they're doing good, but couldn't be here. So Uli thought, well, you don't need just three guitars, because he was the third guitar. So he, he, um, he, he switched to the piano, and I hope he had fun. I mean, I, I had a lot of fun watching him play. <laughs> so good, good. You know, we're going to do something new this year. And we're going to try to do it every month. You can hold us to it. If we don't do it, we could just disappoint you, right? That'd be the worst that could happen. But hold us to it. We're going to really try. The third Sunday of the month, we're going to have a little missions moment. And, and we're just going to take two, three minutes to show you a missionary, give you like a little video of that missionary. This was recorded just a couple days ago um, about a missionary in the Dominican Republic that we know a lot of our church has met him has um, been in his church, ministered in his church, and they'll talk about it, but you've never met him, so this time you get to meet him, and hopefully you'll pray for him and the ministry in the Dominican Republic for the next four weeks until we have our next missions moment. Of course, you could keep praying for him the rest of your life, and that'd be great, but um, that's our focus, is that you would maybe write his name down, learn a little bit about him, and, and keep him in that area in prayer. Also, we're going to have on the third Sunday every month a little table where you can learn more about um, the missionaries that we're supporting and even go on a missions trip or, or show your interest. This guy in the Dominican Republic, we are planning to go see on a missions trip um, this summer and possibly again in October, November area. So if you are interested, please see 
the folks running the booth in the back or talk to me later this week or send an email, whatever, and say, hey, I want to know. Give me some more info and uh, we'll be happy to do that. And so if we're ready, let's, let's show the video here. almost a hundred years. Um, as a mother church, we have uh, over 15 living churches in the Latex, a little cool communities that we serve through our deacons and our leadership. I have a vision. My vision is based, is based on three uh, principles. The first principle is uh, evangelism, personal evangelism. We know that the people need to know the word of God. And the second principle is uh, education. Education involves uh, Discipleship and moral education. And the third point is social work. We evangelize, we uh, disciple the people, and then we do the social work is giving food like Jesus used to do. Um, how can we partnership? How can we work together as churches? Sure, we can work um, by coming to the American public for your mission trip to work with the church. We have facilities, we have places where we can go, we can organize your transportation, your food, your work, and everything that you need here so that you can come and serve with us, alongside us, in the ministry that, that God has entrusted to us. God bless you so much and thank you. Yeah! So if you're praying, who are you going to pray for? Who remembers his name? There you go, there you go. You know the little shirts with that little guy on the horse swinging the little, that's called Polo, right? That's his name. See, that's how my brain works. I know, I'm horrible with names. So um, even if you forget his name, God knows all things. Just say, you know God, the pastor who we watched on the video, and God knows all about it. But the three things they do, and I think you call it evangelism, discipleship, and social work, and they do all three of those really, really well. Um, he mentioned it's a Haitian, and you might be thinking, well, hey, I thought it was the Dominican Republic. Of course, many of you know, but you have some kids here, so it's one island, and the island's split in half, and the Dominican Republic is on one half, and Haiti is on the other half, and so there's a lot of crossover, and so and they have a lot of Dominican Republic folks there too, but there's even a different language, and so he speaks three languages, English, the, the kind of the French they speak in Haiti and Spanish. And he's able to minister across the board to all those people. Now, he mentioned Bates. Bates are very poor communities centered around like fields, but they're incredibly poor, incredibly poor. Um, and, uh, and, and, but that's who he's called to. And so there's 15 Bates that he goes into and starts this kind of micro church. And, um, and then every once in a while, they come to a larger church. In that area of um, Ramana, there's, there's like a clinic, schools, all kinds of things that is going on. And again, if you want to learn more about the exciting work, go on a trip. If you can't go on the trip, there's more info in the back. Well, there's an exciting thing happening today. We've already gotten some great exciting news already there. Um, but I want to call Adam and Amanda... Fontaine and, and bring Jackson with you if you can. And um, if you want to bring whoever you want to bring up, if you want to bring your other kids up, you're welcome to do that. We've had several baby dedications because we're catching up. You know, we, we didn't do them for a year and a half, and now we're catching up. But, but Jackson was born October 7th, and wow, he's getting big. Wow, yeah, you know, yeah, you're holding him. <laughs> yeah, hey, give, her, give him a hand, that's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, here, spread out a little, I'll come over this way. Wow, there he is. Hey, buddy. That's all right, he's sleeping. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. You know, I, I always joke, I was at a, um, a, a nursery at another church, and they had their motto up, and it's a verse in the Bible. It says, we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. You've heard that? Yeah, is that good? Is that good? I thought oh, that is really cute. Okay, all right. Um, of course, that's talking about the second coming of Jesus. But anyway, 
It's good for babies, too. We'll hope that baby Jackson will sleep. All right. So baby dedication, we're, 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 we're really dedicating ourselves. We are dedicating Jackson and really our whole church. And so a part of this, we'll be speaking to all of that. And um, where I like to start at Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 7. The nation of Israel was about to enter the promised land. And God, our heavenly father, gave instructions to fathers and really to all parents. And the whole community. He said, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. And he says, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you drive, I think, when you lie down and when you get up. He says, impress them on your children by talking about them. Talk about the Word of God. This commandment of God we should diligently raise our children to know Jesus, believe in Jesus, and be fully surrendered to Jesus. In obedience to this command, Adam and Amanda, you're bringing Jackson to present him to the Lord. And, and we learned the precedent for this in the baby dedication in, in the Bible when Samuel was presented to the Lord by Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 128. And Jesus was presented to the Lord by Joseph and Mary in Luke 2. 22. Paul reminded Timothy that from a child he had known the Holy Scriptures. Jesus considered the little ones infinitely precious, and he said, Let the little children come to me and forbid them not, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And so the purpose of baby dedication is found in the purpose of the parents, Adam and Amanda, and us as a church. And so Parents, really, you're pledging yourselves to obey the command of Paul when he says, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And so, Adam and Amanda, if it is your intention to present Jackson Fontaine to the Lord and to pledge yourselves to bring him up in the training and instruction of the Lord, please answer, we do, to these following questions. Do you this day recognize Jackson as the gift of God and give heartfelt thanks for God's blessing? We do. do you here this day dedicate Jackson to the Lord who gave him to you? We do. do you here this day pledge as parents that you will bring up Jackson in the training and instruction of the Lord? We do. do you here this day promise to give Jackson every possible benefit of home, of school, and of church. We do. We do. And last one, do you hear this day? Ask God's blessing on Jackson through all his years. We do. we do. Amen, amen. Well, we as a church, we play a role, and we have a sacred responsibility to both Jackson and Adam and Amanda by maintaining a community of love, joy, and passionate spirituality. We foster an atmosphere that, like a greenhouse, promotes health and growth. And so if you want to be a part of creating this for Jackson, stretch out your hand towards him and answer, we do, to this question. Bridge Community Church, do you commit yourselves to support Jackson and his parents through prayer, counsel, biblical teaching, and programs, and affirm Jackson's calling, gifting, and identity in Jesus? We do. Very good. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you for life. Thank you for Adam and for Amanda, for Jackson, for the family. And I know there's a lot of other family who are going to be supporting Jackson in this process. Thank you, God. We pray that you would bless baby Jackson. Fill Jackson with your spirit. Father, make him mighty in spirit and mighty in faith. Father, let him know your love and your plan your design and your purposes, what Jackson's destiny is, why you created him. And I pray, Father, that through Jackson's life, you will receive much, much glory. God, we love you, and we look forward. We're excited to see what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Here you go. Let me, let me risk a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking at me like, what? <laughs>
<laughs> Amen. Amen. Wow. All right. I got I got all these notes, right? I usually don't have a lot of notes, but I I do this time. Oops, but I got them out of order. There we go. That's how we want it. All right. I'm going to start by sharing a story. And um, a story I actually just learned recently. And it's, a, it's kind of a cool story. It's the story of a girl named Shelly Thornton. Shelly Thornton. Now, Shelly Thornton started her life. She was as a girl born at Dallas Osteopathic Hospital on June 2nd of 1970. And um, her mom had a very, very tough, very tough life. And her mom knew right away that it would be best if she wasn't the one raising her daughter. And so as soon as she was born, within a day or two, um, uh, uh, somebody in Dallas area who was very good at connecting um, newborn kids with parents who would want one um, was Henry McCluskey. And Henry found a home for Shelley. And so, um, and so, the, and in that home was, was the name of Ruth Schmidt and Billy Thornton. And they're the ones who named and gave Shelley her name. And so they named her, and, 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 and it says here, um, they, they have learned about this from Billy's older brother. Billy had known Henry McCluskey and adopted a kid. They weren't able to have kids. And so um, they brought him home a couple days after she was born. And, and Billy says, when, when he brought him home to his wife, Ruth, Ruth was ecstatic. He said, you, you ain't never seen a happier woman. Billy recalled. Well, Billy and Shelly, uh, Billy, I'm sorry, and, and Ruth didn't hide from Shelly the fact that she was adopted. And, and they remember as early as five, talking her through that process and saying, you know, here's the special thing about this adoption is that you were chosen. We, we got to choose you. And, um, and made a big deal out of that. Um, Shelly, Shelly was a very happy girl, loved, loved life, had a lot of fun. Um, they remember that Shelly, um, Shelly loved playing the two fairy. Um, Ruth loved outfitting Shelly in all these like princess dresses. And um, it was kind of, kind of a wonderful, wonderful growing up. Shelly enjoyed just being more private and to herself. She loved things like... Um, cheese whiz casserole and pork chops, some of her favorite food. And, um, and, and, and just really, really, everybody was happy. Everybody was happy. And there was a lot of joy. And, and um, that lasted, well, of course, there was ups and downs in the family, as there was, always is. But for the most part, they were happy. Now, obviously, when adopted kids, they get older, they want to know, well, well what really is what really is the origins of, like, my life? And so she did. And it's, it's, in this case, it's kind of an amazing story. An amazing story. She, she found out that her mom was Norma McCorvey. Now, Norma McCorvey, some of you maybe know who she is, but Norma McCorvey is the, the woman who we most know by the name of Jane Roe. Jane Roe from Roe v. Wade, um, which yesterday was the 49th anniversary of that decision being made. Now, they all had like, Shelley, Shelley um, learned through that that she had two other sisters, half-sisters. And they all got together um, probably about nine years ago in 2013. And, um, you know, and that was the first time, they, from what I understand, they were all together. And uh, it's an interesting thing in the history of Roe v. Wade and Jane Roe and Norman McCorvey and Shelley Thornton, the baby. Even though Roe v. Wade gave the ability to have an abortion, 
who was two and a half years after Shelley was born, the process of the courts taking so long, the law, it was illegal in Texas. And so Norma McCorvey or Jane Roe had her baby waiting for the whole process to go through. And, and what's fascinating is now at this point, not a single person regrets having that. In fact, they're all really glad that it took an extra two and a half years for the Supreme Court to make that decision. If the Supreme Court in another case had made that decision, say, five years earlier or even three years earlier, Shelley would have been aborted. She's really glad that that didn't happen. She's married. She has kids. Her husband, her kids are really glad. Jane Roe or Norma McCorvey is her real name. Since that time, she was a young girl at somewhere around 20. Since that time, she's become a Christian. She's since passed away. But she totally changed her views on abortion. She regrets that she was a part of that process. And, and she wishes from her very heart of hearts that abortion would be illegal in our country. I, I know that this is a tough topic for a lot of people. I know there's people here in the church who have come and talked to me and said, you know, I've had an abortion. I've talked with men who said, you know, when I was a kid or in high school and college, I got a girl pregnant. I drove the car. I drove her to the clinic. I told her it was the right thing to do. And you know what? I'm really glad you're here in our church. Whether you've had an abortion, whether you've supported an abortion at some point in the past, I'm really glad you're here. I'm really glad. And I want you to hear my heart on what has become a very difficult thing to talk about. And you can probably hear as I'm talking, I'm a little stuttering, aren't I? It's, it's, not, it's just because I, I know there's a lot of pain mixed up in this conversation. And I love every single one of you. And I love you no matter what your views are about this. And whether you agree with me about this or not, I love you. But I also want to explore with you what the Scripture says. And I also want to share some recent breakthroughs in science that I think wasn't known 50 years ago. In fact, it certainly wasn't known 50 years ago. And I think they make a difference. And so I think the best place to start is in Scripture. And so if we can turn or look on the screen to Psalm 139. By the way, if you want my notes, just send an email and um, I can give you all four pages of notes. I can't give you what I just speak about without the notes. But they'll be recorded, so it'll be on Facebook. Although, who knows on this one, maybe Facebook will... Uh, anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to go there. <laughs> I'm already going into 140 thing, right? I don't need to do two, right? Okay. <laughs> Psalm 139, 13 through 16. For you formed my inward parts. Who's the you? The you is God. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. You've probably heard me say this, but that knitting process is, I think, a picture of the DNA. You know, that helix, the, like the ladder, and, and, and you know, if you stretched out somebody's DNA, you can stretch it from this spot right here all the way to the moon and back for one human being. That's how complicated this knitting together. I believe David was saying, God, you did that. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You've probably heard me say this again, but that word, I'm fearfully made, it's the same word that is used when it says the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. And, and all throughout the Bible, you see this, the fear of the Lord. That's a fear we're supposed to have towards God. That word fear isn't a terror. It actually means a form of respect, a form of, well, it's having a high reg higher regard for what God thinks of you than what other people think of you. That's what the fear of the Lord is. I, I like to joke saying I have a fear of Rachel, my wife, because I have a higher regard for what she thinks about me than all the other women in the world think about me. See what I'm saying? 
with this term fear of the Lord, there's something love that's there, isn't there? Like that's why I have a fear of Rachel and that's why I have a higher regard for what she thinks of me because I love her and I know she loves me. I love her more than I love every other woman, any other woman. And so I have the fear of Rachel. Fear is probably not the best way to word it, but that's, that's how it was worded in the ancient Hebrew. And so this is the fear of God. We have a higher regard for what God thinks of us because we love him than we do what other people think of us. Now, you say, well, what's this? Because that's the word, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. In the same way that we have this high regard of what God thinks, God says, when I made you, I did it with this same kind of fear. I, I, was, I was really paying attention to what are you going to think about my creation? In other words, God is saying your thoughts about yourself mattered an awful lot to him when he made you. You were made fearfully and wonderfully. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Let's keep going in this passage. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book. One minute, we'll get to that in a minute. If, if anybody who really looks through Scripture and is honest with what it means and really takes it seriously. What is the Bible actually saying? And not doing mental gymnastics, trying to impose a preconceived viewpoint onto it. If you're being intellectually honest, you have to assume that the Bible takes this stance that says life begins at the very latest at conception. In fact, you can make the argument that life begins actually before conception, that life begins when God thinks about you when God thought about you and prescribed your parts and, and created and sent a download for your life, that that's when life begins. But you might want to say physically then it begins at conception. Let's just go back and tie it into this, guys. Go back just one slide. Yeah. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, all right, now we'll go, every one of them. The days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. See, while there was nothing there, God kind of prescribed every part of you. He knew every part of you. He designed every part of you. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, Jeremiah is going through basically his calling from God. And, and he's hearing the voice of God. And in the call, he says this, Before I formed you, God says, Before I formed you, Jeremiah, in your mother's body, I chose you. Notice, this is why I say it even life begins before conception. He's basically saying, before you were conceived in your mother's body, I chose you. Before that. Before, and who did the forming? P people think, well, a father and a mother, they create the life. No, the Bible again makes it very clear. Every life is created by God. And we'll get some more scriptures in that. But before I formed you in your mother's body, I chose you. See, you were chosen before you were conceived for a purpose. God made you on purpose for a purpose. And he knew your purpose before you were ever even conceived. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I set you apart. See, God has a unique purpose for you, a unique thing for you. I set you apart to serve me. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. So you are formed by God. You are chosen by God. You are set apart by God. You are appointed by God. And all of that happened before you were ever even born. Because you are a unique person. And you become a unique person in the mind of God. And that starts then when you are conceived. And it grows. That's you. You're an amazing person. You're absolutely astonishing. The way God makes you and his dreams for you. And, you know, in this, we get this understanding that you, you uniquely 
have a way to give God joy like no one else can have. You are unique, and you can give God love in a way no one else can love God. And you're like, how can that be? Well, I, I tell you, you, I have five kids, right? You can pick whichever one. And every once in a while, I might pick for you. But anyway, every once in a while, just for a quick moment. You know, you can take, pick one and, and take them away from me for the rest of my life, however that would be. The love that that person gives me cannot be replaced by the other four, right? If I had another kid with Rachel, and so let's say you took off one, and that person, does that person replace that one? No, right? The love that, I will love this sixth child with all my heart, just like I love the other five. I will love them with all my heart. And they might grow to love me with all their heart. I mean, it might be an amazing relationship, but it still doesn't replace the one that was taken away. This one loves me in a way unique to this person. They bring me joy in a way unique to this person. I love them in a way that's unique to that person. And it's that way with God and you. Yeah, there's billions of people, but God knows you by name. And he's called you, he's appointed you, he's formed you, he created you, he knows you. And you give him joy and love in a way that none of the other billions of people on earth can give to God. And if you are not giving it to God, there's an empty spot in the heart of God that only you can fill. And there's an empty spot in your heart that only God can fill. That's how valuable and precious you are to God. In Luke chapter 1, 15... It's talking about John the Baptist, and there's a prophecy. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Of course, that got fulfilled, right? When, when, when Mary came, and Mary had already conceived Jesus. And Jesus was just a few weeks old, but John the Baptist was six months old, still unborn, but six months old, six months along in the pregnancy. And Mary comes in. And John leaps and was filled with the Spirit, just like this prophecy said, by Jesus. When Jesus was just a few weeks old, he's filling John with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Notice when this happens, before the foundation of the world. Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. You were chosen way back then. I believe your life began when God chose you. Your life began when he thought of you, he planned you. Because your life is in the mind and the heart of God. In Isaiah chapter 45, 9 through 11, the Lord is the Holy One of Israel. He made them. He says to them, are you asking me about what will happen to my children? Are you telling me what I should do with what my hands have made? Sometimes we get a little arrogant as a society. I think humans tend to be arrogant in general throughout all societies. We think we make things and then we can destroy things. God makes things, and only God has the right to destroy them. He makes them, he destroys them. In Job 33, 4, Job says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. This is, this, these are so many passages. Now, I want to share with you, several months ago, well, I guess the story starts about three years ago. A law was made in Mississippi saying abortion would be illegal from week 15. And it came to the Supreme Court several months ago. Um, in, in December, I guess. A couple months, one month ago. And, um, and, and a lot has been kind of made out of this. And like I said, science has made some amazing, and I don't want to make this about science, but, 
there's been some amazing developments. And this has been reflected in cultures where politics is not as big of an issue surrounding this issue, like, like abortion, like it is in the United States. It's become such a political hot potato. I wish it wasn't. And maybe you don't know, but 47, there's 50 countries in Europe, 50 official, because some of them are so small, they're only a city, but there's 50 official countries in Europe. 47 of them do not allow abortion past week 15. In fact, all 50 of them put restrictions. None of the 50 European nations allow abortion on demand like the United States does. In fact, the United States is one of only eight countries that allows abortion on demand in the entire world. Two other of those countries, North Korea and China, I don't think that's good company we want to be with. But that's because the science has shown how horrendous. It's, it's probably very, one of, I think, the most barbaric thing. To take this sacred place, what should be the most safest place in the world for a, a baby, the womb of their mother, and to invade that sacred place and to take the life the reason we know week 15 is kind of an, an issue, by week 15, lips, eyes, nose, even eyebrows are all formed. By week 15, you know if, of course, the gender of the baby, you know if it's going to be left-handed or right-handed. Many, many babies, you know, things like that. All of the vital organs are developed by fifth, week 15. And by week 15, and possibly earlier, but we know by week 15, that baby can and does experience pain. And they call it the silent scream. And if you, if, uh, I don't know that I recommend you watch it, but if you're on the fence, maybe you should. But now they have high definition video of abortions happening. And you can see the baby scream in pain as its life is being taken. And it's horrendous. It's absolutely horrendous. This should not be an issue, week 15. It, it, it is, it, I mean, it, in many countries, like France, um, Switzerland, all the Scandinavian countries, abortion is illegal after week 12. Um, Germany, Luxembourg, those countries, it's illegal after 14, week 14, Italy. It's just... I mean, I can't put into words. You, you will cry if you watch those, those videos. It is that barbaric. And, and yet we allow it. Now, people like to say, well, what about, what about love? Are they, you know, should we bring in to the world babies who aren't loved? I told you about Roe v. Wade, Jane Road, Norma McCovey. Her baby, Shelly, was very loved. Very, very loved. In fact, Shelly grew up happy. You think about it. She made her adopted mom, Ruth, happy. Her adopted dad, Barry, happy. Eventually, she reunites with her two stepsisters, and they're all happy to know each other. She is married, her husband... She makes him happy. She has kids. She's making them happy. She said she had a long-held private hope that her birth mom, Norma, Jane Rowe, would one day feel something for another human being, especially for one she brought into this world. Now that Norma was dying, Shelley felt that desire acutely. I want her to experience this joy, the good that it brings. I have wished that for her forever and have never told anyone until now. I mean, all that joy, all that, and it is love. But beyond that, beyond that, like I mentioned, there's the joy of God. Here's what he says in Romans 9, 25. I'll call the unloved and make them be loved. God is the one with great compensation. God always makes things just. 
He says, those who are unloved, I put a special love on them. He says in another place, I will be a father to the orphan. God says, they become my special children, and I take care of them. And we bring into this conversation a profound faith. You know, this faith is something my wife and I, Rachel and I, were able to recognize. For, for We met at an orphanage. And she was the counselor, and I was the director. And, and we had orphans from three countries, from Russia, from uh, Mexico, and from the Philippines. And it's funny, you know, now, now that, I mean, I mentioned Facebook and whatnot, but one of the things I love about Facebook is that we get to connect with many of them. Um, and, and, and it's really cool. Um, in fact, my mom and dad, after I took care of orphan, orphans in, the Philippi, you know, in Indianapolis, but they were Filipino orphans, they went to the Philippines and took care of some of those same kids and see them become adults and get married. And... Now, in the orphans we took care of, almost all of them, they were orphans be not because their mom or dad died or both mom and dad died, but because they were abandoned. Almost all the orphans we took care of were just left somewhere, maybe at the steps of a hospital or a police station or something like that. And nobody knows who their parents are. They were left and abandoned, and there's no way to know. But I can tell you, every one of the ones I know, they're loved. Everyone is loved by God and others. And, and, by, and by now, and, and it's kind of fun, a few years ago, one of Nastya, um, which is Russian and short for Anastasia, um, anyway, Anastasia, and, and, and she came, and, and, and she, she, she lived with us when she was an orphan, and I knew her in Indianapolis, and she came to visit us a few years ago. And uh, we went to New York City together. She wanted to go to New York City. She said, well, why don't you come stay some time at our house? We're only a couple hours away. We'll drive with you. And we went down and we went to New York City. And she had a baby. We got to meet her baby. And she was married and she still is married. And here she is again. She's happy. She's making her husband happy. As a mom, she's making her child happy. She has no idea who her real mother is, as far as I know. But she's so glad her mother chose, and her husband is glad, her baby is glad, that her mother chose to have her and have her adopted, then to end that life. It's such a permanent decision, and often not thought through, and often made a, it's a decision made by people very vulnerable, very young, very inexperienced making decisions. Proverbs 31.8 says, Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Speak up for the rights of all those who are poor. And, and I wonder, and sometimes I ask myself this, do I do enough speaking up? I think we all know that the unborn can't speak for themselves. And I believe this voice, this verse is telling us we have a role, no matter who we are, to speak for those who can't speak for themselves. Proverbs goes on in, 20, in, in chapter 24, 11, and 12, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Rescue them. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this, does not he who weigh the heart perceive it? Since Roe v. Wade, over the last 49 years, over 60 million babies in the United States have been aborted. And that's something we can't say we don't know. You just heard it. It's a, it's a real thing. Can you imagine 60 million people alive today, making music, getting married, having kids of their own, I'm sure some of them would have had a hard life. I'm sure that's, that's the way life is, right? Many of them, we know, would have had a wonderful life just by the statistics. I'm going to read to you something.
from Abby, who decided to speak up. Abby Johnson. Here's what she said. I had left my job as a Planned Parenthood clinic director. Okay, so she's the director of a Planned Parenthood clinic. Now that's more administrative. Only three months earlier, I had just undergone a radical conversion after witnessing the destruction of a 13-week-old fetus during an ultrasound-guided abortion. She saw firsthand everything I kind of explained earlier. So she's an admin role. What happened is there was a, there was a quick... Um, well, something happened. They need an extra person. So she put on her scrubs, cleaned her hands, and for the first time... Instead of being administration behind a desk, she's actually in the clinic helping the doctor and she's seeing with her eyes on the screen what he's doing. She walked out. She quit. I was on the opposing side of those people for years. I had angrily protested against them. I had said mean things to them, especially the people who prayed on the sidewalk outside my clinic. And I wondered, would they judge me? Would they shove everything I had said back in my face? Even worse, would they say I wasn't worthy of redemption, that abortion workers should be hated and despised for what they did? You know, when I met them, it didn't go exactly the way I had expected. Women were coming to me, and they were literally falling on me, crying and sharing their stories of abortion regret. I used to be screaming at pro-life, pro-lifers. I was so, so angry. Now I get the opportunity to say I'm sorry to the women who have abortions. That I'm so sorry for my work in the abortion clinic. And afterwards, I see the peace in the faces of the women listening. They just want someone to acknowledge their pain and see them. And I do. It's a special feeling to have walked away from our work at the abortion clinic and to now walk in solidarity with other pro-lifers who want to end abortion. It feels good to know we are finally on the right side. You know, there's many, many doctors. Rachel has a friend, a doctor in Canada, an OBGYN doctor, who who, um, advised and promoted many, many, many women to have an abortion. And, and um, again, with uh, advances in science and all, she, she's done a 180 on it. And, and as I, said, I know there's women here who have had an abortion. I know there's men. I know there's lots of people supported. But I want to also know that God loves us. What I prayed earlier after we ended worship, that in spite of anything we may have said or done, God deeply, profoundly loves you and that is absolutely true God deeply profoundly loves you I love you we in this church love you but we love you enough to say we got to have this conversation and we have to talk there is forgiveness there is healing there is love there is hope there is joy Somebody asked me once, well, what what happens to my baby? (laughs) I think, you know, that baby, I believe, and I do believe this. See, in in Hebrews chapter 12, well, in Hebrews 11, it talks through all the great heroes of faith in the Old Testament, or many of them. And in Hebrews 12, it says, seeing we are encompassed with this great cloud of witnesses, Let us run the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So when people ask me, well, what happens? I I, I think of that verse. From that verse, we know that the people who have gone before us become a witness to our life. It says we're in companies with a great cloud of witnesses. What do witnesses do? They see and they hear, they observe. They become a witness. I believe that unborn babies are now a witness to our life. It says in Hebrews that Jesus always lives to make intercession for us. I think that's what those witnesses do now. I think they pray for me. They pray for you. That means my grandfather, who started the church I became the pastor of and we migrate, I believe he's witnessing my life always and he's praying for me. I think, just like Jesus is. I believe your unborn children 
moms, dads, I believe they're witnessing your life. I believe they're praying for you. I believe they're rooting for you. Run the race set before you. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Be healed. Be healed. I believe they pray for your healing. They are rooting for your life, that they're for you, and that they love you, and that there will be a reunion in heaven between you and them that will be filled with joy. We know in heaven there's no sorrow, there's no regret. And I do believe that. I believe that the... I believe that those 60 million, we need to speak for them. Those who can't speak for themselves, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, they'll look back. I don't think it's going to be slavery that was going to be thought of as the most barbaric thing that our country has allowed, as barbaric as that is. I believe it's going to be abortion. I believe that. But so does Alveda King. Dr. Martin Luther King's niece. She said, over 60 million babies have died by abortion in America since the killing of babies in the womb became legal with the passage of Roe v. Wade in 1973. Added to their deaths are the physical, mental, and spiritual trauma many mothers have documented after those abortions. Abortion is death care, not health care. It's time to end the killing. Alveda King, who took up the mantle of her uncle, Dr. Martin Luther King, fighting for racial justice, said there's something far more important that we've got to fix. And we've got to fix the injustice of those who can't speak for themselves, who haven't even taken their first breath. And we need to change. He says, she said, it's time to end the killing. So I have one final verse to close with. And, and I'll invite Uli and the team to come up. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, God is giving a promise. We spoke about the promise earlier today with baby Jackson in Deuteronomy chapter um, 6 when he was telling parents, you know, these, these commandments... He said, put them into the hearts and minds of your kids when you lie down and rise up and all these things. Well, at the end of Deuteronomy, the nation of Israel is just about to cross into the promised land and God has one final thing for them. He says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Jane Rowe, whose real name, Norma McCorvey, in 1989, she flipped and she said, I'm gonna choose life. And she chose life for every day of her life after that. Her daughter, Shelley Thornton, says, I choose life. Her other two daughters, Shelley's stepsisters, I choose life. Abby Johnson, the Planned Parenthood worker, who was a part of so many abortions in her clinic, when she saw for herself what it really was, she said, I can't do that anymore. I choose life. I hope you'll pray through this. I hope you'll think through this. I hope you'll study this. If you want my notes, I'm happy to send them to you. And you can source everything I've said. I hope that like all those others, with me, with God, with Jesus, you'll say, I'm going to be on the side of choosing life. And more than choosing it, I'm going to speak for those who can't speak for themselves. I'm going to rescue those who are being taken away from death. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray every day. And like Elvita King, I'm going to say it's time to end this killing. It's time to end. Would you close with a word of prayer with me? And then we have a song I want to lead us in as a prayer. Father, I, I, I do come before you thanking you for your love, thanking you for your forgiveness. 
And Father, some of us, we need forgiveness for being judgmental because we judged those who were deceived instead of the father of lies, of deception. And we hated people, maybe, instead of saying, I'll lay down my life. And so God, if there's any judgmentalism, forgive us. If there's any choices that any of us made, encouraging or actually following through with abortion, God, I pray for your forgiveness and your healing right now. In Jesus' name. I pray for every one of us that you would bring a healing. And for our nation, God, I believe we need healing as a nation. Healing as a nation. That we would not celebrate death as if it were a good thing. And so, God, we come and we cry before you. And we cry out to you. And just as Daniel repented for things he never did, but he repented for his nation, God, we repent for our nation. And we ask for your grace and your mercy to change our hearts and change our minds and become supportive of life. We ask for your forgiveness and your mercy. We ask, Lord, that you would have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on us as individuals. Have mercy on our nation. And have mercy on our world. We ask these things in Jesus' name. If you... um, This song is just what I just prayed. Lord, have mercy. And if that's the cry of your heart, just as a prayer, let's just sing this as a prayer that the Lord would have mercy. Also, we have some folks to pray. If you'll come up here now, if you want prayer for anything, whether it's on this topic or any other topic, then uh, would our prayer team come up now? And and they're going to pray for whatever you have on your heart. But I want to encourage you especially if it's this topic, whoever you are, ask for prayer. Don't leave with this on your heart. If you want to make an appointment with me or me and Rachel or whatever, then just let us know and we can do a, we can, we'd be happy to love you and to pray with you. God wants there to be healing and restoration. And so let's sing this together as our prayer. Pray this with us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Yes, God. For we have prayed for the
Dear Jesus, thank you that you are a merciful God and you are faithful. That your love is steadfast and it endures forever. That great is your faithfulness, O Lord. 49 years ago yesterday, the worst decision in our nation was made. But this is the year of Jubilee. And so we ask God in your mercy to reverse that decision. And we ask God that every one of us, from in the womb and conception all the way till we breathe our final breath, will know and experience your love and your joy and to know the uniqueness we have of giving you love and joy and that we'll celebrate life. We ask you to bless even now as we celebrate the life of Jackson. And some of us may stay here for a while longer and that's okay if you want to stay here. And keep praying and pressing into this. And get prayer if you desire. And, and at some point, I encourage you to migrate over. We have a special cake for baby Jackson and I think empanadas for, from the DR. And so anyway, we want to welcome that too. It's all a part of this. As we cry out for mercy and then we celebrate life, it's the same thing. Thank you, Jesus, Thank for your great love. We love you so much. In your name, amen.